So this is a basic 360 degree camera. It's taking a photograph of everything in the room. You can get very fancy models. Nokia, the former global company, now makes a uh, camera that costs 60 or $70,000 that shoots in very, very high definition. And you can use this to make films. Now, you've all been, I think, strongly encouraged to get a cardboard for yourselves. And let me continue to encourage you not just to get a cardboard, but to grab the Jaunt app and to download and watch Collisions, which I believe is running in the um, UMass of the Art that's going around here, which is a story from Central Australia about a 65-year-old indigenous gentleman who was the first person in his mob to encounter a European. And so it's beautifully shot, beautifully told, and you know, it was a big uh, film this year at Sundance. So we're starting to see how you can produce films that incorporate the landscape. And the interesting thing is this also changes the nature of cinema, because all of the cinema and all of the television you've ever seen has been very carefully shot to include a very specific view of the world. That's what the cinematographer and the director decide together. And when you get immersive cinema, it's much more around producing a sense of place rather than a sense of scene. And so this is going to change our entire language around cinema as well. Now, it's interesting. Last night, foreign correspondent on ABC did a piece about the trade in poppies in Myanmar, and they released a 360-degree video. Foreign correspondent traveled to Shanghai, Myanmar, to scratch the surface of the tourism boom. Here on a serene inlay lake, its fishermen offer a glimpse of traditional life. And from the quality of this, it's completely possible they shot it Moments with the data. The yeah, yeah. I think I, th I think it's probably what they shot it with because it's not particularly high quality. It's okay quality. But again, it gives you a sense of place there. All right, so you get that sense of having being inside something. Now it's interesting. A couple of months ago, I was talking to a fellow who is a wedding photographer, and he said. I showed him this, because it was right after I got it, and I was all excited about it. He said, oh my god, I absolutely need that, because I have weddings where the grand can't cross the country to watch her granddaughter get married, but I can capture it here, and then hand Gran a gear VR, and Gran can actually be there watching them getting married. And just last week, he actually shared his first video with me, so it's become a way to bring presents, and this is actually probably going to represent a new generation of where the family video and the family photograph are going. Okay, so that's immersive, immersive cinema. Immersive cinema is gonna be huge. We're also, by the way, the NCAA Final Four are going on last weekend and this weekend. And if you have a gear VR, you can download an app and you can actually watch these matches courtside in 180 degrees. So I'm gonna show you the stands behind you, but you can actually watch the match in real time as it's being broadcast. And having seen a uh, basketball game captured like that is an incredible experience. It has a very similar to that watching on the television simply doesn't capture. So one of the big areas for immersion is going to be in bringing you to an event that you're not at. And I think perhaps not in Rio, but I suspect by the time of the Tokyo Olympics, that's going to be the primary viewing mechanism for a lot of people. All right, let's talk about simulations and simulacra. So, another game that was released just this morning is called Fantastic Contraction. I think of it as the other killer app for the HTC Vive. Take a look. Now the interesting thing is that there's a goal in here, right? You're supposed to get the ball over there, but in fact, when you get in there, all you want to do is start building stuff and just playing with the objects that have physics and have mechanics associated with them, because you've never had this kind of capacity to sort of be an engineer. And 
imagine now if you're teaching someone engineering principles and you can bring them into a world where materials have the material qualities and they can build things and test them. Will that bridge work? Will that building stand up? These are the kinds of things that you can start to see already being possible with an app like Fantastic Contraption. So again, if you're on Steam and you have a VR system, you can download that today. Now to me, uh, Tilt Brush and Fantastic Contraption are the two outstanding examples of the kinds of apps that we're going to see happen. But there's another whole class of apps, so rather than simulation, simulacro. And over the Easter holiday weekend, I had an Oculus Rift, a very early version, and I downloaded a lot of the content that was available for the Oculus Rift. And I downloaded this particular one, and I just, I'm going to sort of show you, and then I'm going to sort of talk through what happened, and I know John will want to talk about this too. So the app is called 846. You bring it forward to around here. What you're going to see is the stereo pair, what you're actually seeing in real time as the app is going. So you see you're sitting in an office. Pretty boring, right? You're sitting in an office. Coworker has asked you to hand them a file. So you have to go find the file, look around the desk, get the file. Can you give it to me? Hand it to the coworker. On the floor right here, on your left. this through have told me that at the end of this game you're left with two alternatives. You can either leap to your death off the building which plenty of people did on that day or you can comfort the co-worker who is begging you to stay with her and suffocate. I, I, I wondered I wondered after this why you would take the most publicly traumatic event of the 21st century and make that fertile grounds for a simulation. What purpose is being served here? Now, we know that virtual reality can be used to help desensitize people to their phobias, if they have phobias around snakes or around spiders or whatever it might be. But in this case, I wasn't quite clear why I would want to be in this position. I think cases do differ on that, but there's been a lot of discussion. And this is going to be a question. Now that we have the capacity to pretty much simulate anything we want, the question is now going to be, what's appropriate to simulate? It becomes a question of ethics in design. All right. Now, next up, I was just in California. And I got to see one of the most amazing demonstrations of a VR technology that I've ever seen from a company called EDI. So we're going to take this and move this. All right. I just want a video for you to see you on your grown and you have your own family and um, someone that you love as much as I love you. Now, look. that looks like a video image. Watch. But you're still the sweetest baby ever. It's not video. It's fully three-dimensional. All right. I just want a video for you to see when you're grown and you have your own family and um, someone that you love so, as much as I love you. Look, you're getting fussy, but you're still the sweetest baby ever. AI's technology uses 40 high-definition cameras in a sort of theater in the round, puts the person in the middle, records a 
about a terabyte a minute, uploads it to the cloud, takes 20 hours to progress, uh, process, and when it comes down, what you get is the equivalent of video, but in three dimensions. And so this is now, you can capture actor, actors, you can capture characters, you can capture whatever you like. And once they have it captured and stored up there, they can produce it in whatever, um, whatever quality they want. So they can do it in very high quality, they can do it in low quality, they can do it for a mobile device, they can do it for a VR system, they can do it for a desktop system. And so we're now starting to see these capacities to be able to capture in a very interesting way. All right, so that actually brings us to talking about augmented reality. So, so far we've talked about virtual reality, which is completely shutting off the outside world so that you can get a look around at another world. Augmented reality is the idea that, in fact, the real world has enormous value, as does the virtual world, so we integrate them together in the display. So what you do is you actually see the real world, and then what you see is projected into the real world are things that don't exist in the real world. In other words, it's almost a way to be able to bring the imagination into the real world. Now, the two candidates for these systems are Microsoft's HoloLens, which is shown up here. Now, this actually began to ship last week. So it's in a, in a version that costs about $3,500. So it's still quite expensive. And you can see that it's got cameras up here. And the reason it has cameras is because what it's actually doing is it's mapping out the space that you're in. And as you move through that space, if there's something over here in the virtual world in that space, you can move over here and look back and it will be exactly where it is supposed to be because the unit itself has mapped out the space and knows where the virtual objects in the real space are. All right, and it's, it's outstanding technology. I mean, in terms of Microsoft actually producing something that has advanced the state of the art, HoloLens has done that. And in a demo, I'll show you in a second, you'll see why. Now this is the other system, this is called Magic Leap. This is supposedly a smuggled photo of an early prototype of it. Very little is known about Magic Leap other than that they have received a billion dollars in venture capital from Google to produce a mixed reality, augmented reality system. But we don't know too much about this except that people have seen some very flash demos of what it can do, but no one believes it yet because this is how that system looks right now. All right, so when it comes back to this idea of human communication, this is a demo that was released by Microsoft last week of something that they call holoportation. Hi, today we're going to show you an exciting new technology that could fundamentally change the way that people will communicate in the future. Imagine being able to virtually teleport from one space to another in real time. Hey, Sergio, uh, how does it feel like to be holoported into Greg in our project? So Sergio I'm going to wear mine. We can see each other in full 3D in real 
when there are hollow lenses that probably cost three or four hundred dollars, you can get down to JD Hi-Fi and pick one up. And the camera systems, well, those are probably going to be a little bit more expensive, but some next generation connect like device will probably be for those in the home. So this is the leading edge of where virtual reality is going. And while I say it's probably the least interesting element of virtual reality is in fact its use in game. Now, back in 1990, when virtual reality was just starting to become big the first time, I read a very interesting interview with this gentleman, Jaron Lanier, who's widely thought to be the father of virtual reality. In fact, success at that time had many fathers. He was certainly one of them, and he did a very good job of making it quite a popular medium in the popular consciousness. And in this interview, he said something, and as I read it, it literally changed my life, which was my penny drop moment. He said, VR is not the television of the, of the future. It's not just something where you sit and passively consume content, although you've seen plenty of that today. VR is the telephone of the future. In other words, it's a way for us to be able to communicate better with one another. That's always been my goal with this medium. I'm hoping that after this lecture today, you folks can actually understand why that's the case and why it is so exciting. Thank you. Cool. Um, just before you go, I, I have uploaded some